Welcome to Banking Weekly from the Financial Times with me, Caroline Binham. Joining me in the studio today is Laura Noonan, the FT's investment banking correspondent. This week we'll be discussing the rise of fintech and speaking to Julian Scan of Accenture. Then Patrick Jenkins, our finance editor, will be speaking to the Bank of International Settlements' Jaime Caruana about risks from a strengthening dollar. And finally, as the US earnings season kicks off, Alistair Gray, our US banking correspondent, spoke to outspoken analyst Dick Beauvais about the relationship between press reporting and, dare we say, misreporting and disappointing results. So, Laura, fintech seems to be the big buzzword of the last year or so within financial services. And a new report released this week by Accenture shows that it's only getting bigger. Global investment in fintech ventures has reached $5.3 billion, which is a 67% increase over the same period last year. We'll speak to Accenture's Julian Scan in just a second, but from banks' point of view, how's it looking? Well, I mean, fintech has become a very big business, and there are figures from Accenture. There have been previous figures actually estimating the investment in fintech far higher. A recent report by Citi had the global investment at $19 billion last year. So there's a lot of different ways to consider fintech, and I think you'll find the banks, they're all talking about how much they're investing themselves in fintech. They're all trying to partner with some of the smaller fintech companies. They're really trying to play both sides of this because fintech is essentially going to be the future and from the bank's perspective either they can get in at the bottom floor with some of these new guys or they can cede share to these guys so they're certainly taking a very active interest in all things fintech are there any areas potentially of concern for them though well i guess the biggest area of concern is that they're going to lose out on income to these new fintech providers who are because they tend to be newer companies and smaller companies they're much better suited to innovation so they're going to be able to move faster And the big fear is that they're going to take business from the banks and the fintechs, they also pick their spots. So if you're a fintech company and you're looking at the overall banking universe, you're going to try and get into the area which is the highest earnings. So the big fear for banks is that fintech takes off all these high earning sweet spots and leaves the bank with the dollar lower earning stuff. And that is the big threat. So you have fintechs have already taken a lot of space in the payment space. So fintechs are heavily invested in the foreign exchange payments, other kinds of payments. That's a business banks used to make money in. Some fintechs are now playing in the loans business. So banks are definitely concerned that they may lose some of the more lucrative streams of business, but then they will be stuck doing the less lucrative stuff like say home loan, business loan, stuff which banks have to do, but which they don't necessarily make the same margin on as they would on some of the office space that they've been ceding to fintechs. Thanks, Laura. So let's turn to Julian Scan, who is a managing director of financial services at Accenture and one of the authors of their new report. So, Julian, where are we seeing the fastest rates of growth in fintech investment? Uh, Asia is the story this year where the amount of investment in um, fintech outside the FS industry has quadrupled to uh, just over four billion US dollars. That's four billion of the five point three billion in total that your report cited. So the total is just over 22 billion globally. Right. Wow. Um, in in Asia, it's a, you know really jumped to be a big portion of that. And China and India are now the second and third biggest countries for fintech investment. Right. And how much of this investment globally is flowing into fintech companies seeking to compete with the more traditional financial services firms? It's still um, more than 50 percent globally of the investment is going into compete models, but there are quite big differences by market between compete and collaborate money, with um, the two starkest contrasts being New York, which is now 60% collaborate, um, and the UK, which by dollar value is 92% compete. So the disruptors have the upper hand in the UK? They have more of the this type of investment. I think what's important to remember is that all of this investment within the 22 billion is investment going into fintech uh, startups and scale-ups that are outside the sector. So you would expect more of this to be compete money. The 50 or so billion that the banks invest globally within their own walls is an equivalent number. And of course, that is all collaborate money because that's spent by the banks on the banks. But what about banks' investments in their own technology systems? I mean, they're infamously quite sclerotic. It's a very difficult area to analyse because 
there is not data on exactly where the money goes, but globally, overall banks spend about $350 billion a year on IT. Within that, we estimate that somewhere between 50, 60, maybe 70 billion is spent on new fintech, where the banks are creating their own IP. Um, I think the interesting uh, number to get hold of, which it's only possible to guess at, is what sort of return do they get in that investment and how much of that return is complicated by all the issues that you mentioned in the word sclerotic. And what about the sort of more philosophical points of view? I mean, there's a debate really as to how much innovation there, there should be in finance. I mean, Paul Volcker famously said that the only really important innovation in finance over the last 20 years has been the ATM. I mean, where do you stand on that? I don't subscribe to that point of view that there's been no innovation. I think the word innovation was obviously polluted by a sense of financial innovation where that's looking to only benefit a very small number of people. I think the innovations to make our lives easier at the very retail end are very real. You know, Ultimately, cash doesn't help anybody. It's in a very inefficient way for us to run our, run our lives. At the other end of the spectrum, some of the innovations that are capable in terms of assessing whether you can lend to a company is allowing lending that would not have otherwise been uh, you know, allowed. So I think innovation is you know, it's a raw lever that can be very useful. Um, it can always be bent in the wrong direction. Julian, thanks very much. So on to our next topic. Patrick Jenkins, our finance editor, spoke recently to Jaime Caruana of the Bank of International Settlements about his research on the emerging market risk that has come from an inflating dollar and particularly the effects on the asset management industry. Here's what he had to say. So emerging markets are facing now a situation in which, on the one hand, the credit cycle in those places where there has been this cycle is maturing and a particular segment, which is the dollar, which is particularly tightening as the dollars move up. And this materializes in financial stability issues, but it also can materialize in terms of deteriorating the fundamentals because these companies will have to struggle and probably will reduce investment, will reduce hiring, will reduce the normal activity, and this can have repercussions in the economies. This sounds very much like another Asian crisis around the corner. Oh, I think we are in a very different situation, and in fact, the emerging markets have quite a number of mitigants that can help to smooth the whole process. First, they have improved significantly their policies over the past few years and policy frameworks. Second, they have a significant amount of reserves. And third, some of the debt that has been issued is long-term, and in that sense, some of the rollover concerns are postponed to some extent. But that doesn't eliminate some of the contagions and effects that we were mentioning. So I think it's a very different from the Asian crisis. Now, one contagion risk, the kind of second-order effect, is, I guess, to the global asset management industry, where we've already seen, obviously, some funds suffer quite dramatically from the volatility that we've had in the markets over recent months. Do you see that as now a priority for regulators to get their arms around this sector? It's been lightly regulated, certainly compared to the banks, and yet potentially systemic risks are building up there and could very well cause a lot of damage. One of the things that have happened after the crisis is that some of the global financing has moved, or at least activity has moved from banks to asset managers and to search for yield as a mechanism and therefore, this has uh, attracted a lot of the interest and, attrac- and attraction from the regulators to make sure that this market-based financing is safe. And there are many good things to say about market-based financing. But we need to understand better how asset managers are working, and there is a significant amount of work. There is work under the FSB analysis of shadow banking, There is particularly work now in terms of looking at the potential vulnerabilities of asset management functions, structural vulnerabilities that could be there, for example, mismatches between the liquidity of the assets that a fund holds and the risks of redemptions that they may face. This is something, leverage in the funds, operational risks. There are a number of risks that are being examined and probably there will be some consultation later this year to follow the work. 
there has been a lot of work on market liquidity, and it is true that um, there is more securities, more markets, more active, and at the same time, some of the dealers have reduced their capacity or their willingness to use their balance sheet to provide liquidity. So this is something that we have been uh, analyzing, and uh, a lot of work has been done both internationally and nationally. There are some uh, authorities that are already taken actions in terms of stress test and all that, and I think this is something that we will continue to analyze, and it will require most importantly that um, asset managers really internalize that the situation now is of less liquidity than it used to be, and that we don't want to go back to the previous situation, because at that point of time, the pricing of liquidity, market liquidity risk was not properly done. Isn't there a risk that in taking such a long time to consult and decide on what rules should be imposed on the asset management industry, that while this is all happening, a crisis is unfolding and causing chaos within the industry? Well, I think first it's important to know exactly what are the risks and what is the situation. So an, a deep analysis is always required. But I think that just the analysis and the consultation processes and the fact that authorities are already taking measures, for example, in terms of this tighter regulation, for example, in terms of redemptions, etc., and liquidity cautions that funds should have, just the consultation process, I think it is... Uh, bringing awareness and I think is bringing some positive results on the part of the funds. So I think we are analyzing things, but things are already happening and already being done. That's exactly right. Hamek Aran, thank you very much. Thank you. And finally, as the US earnings season kicks off, Alistair Gray, our US banking correspondent, spoke to outspoken analyst Dick Bovey about the relationship between press reporting and, dare we say, misreporting and disappointing results. Dick Bovey, who's Vice President of Equity Research at Rafferty Capital Markets, joins me down the line from uh, Florida on Skype. He produced an interesting research note the other day saying banks need uh, better press relations. Misinformation is harming the stocks. Um, He says that the business press constantly pours out factual inaccuracies and no one seems to care. So, Dick, I wonder in what sense is this actually harming bank share prices, if if this is indeed correct? Well, my goodness, there's so many examples. Uh, I'll give you a couple. One is, uh, you know, the banking industry is doing really well in uh, making auto loans because this is a record auto year. The first thing you'll see in the press is an article about uh, bad loans being made in the auto industry. If uh, there's a problem uh, with the oil sector because of uh, low oil prices, Right away, there'll be articles concerning how banks are going to get into incredible difficulty because of that. And we can go even broader. In the period when banks were being pilloried for having caused the financial crisis, the U.S. government or the Justice Department would call newspapers and indicate that they were about to sue a bank on a specific reason. And there would be a a full-blown article about why the banks did such a terrible job in such an area. But there was never any countervailing argument. In other words, the other side was never listened to. So um, we're going into results season, and I think we can anticipate some of the headlines on the investment banking side. There'll be big declines in trading revenues, retail banks. There's a lot of focus on the, the so-called net interest margin. What's the narrative as you see it going into the, the results? Well, I think it's, it's clearly going to be a very disappointing quarter. I think there's been a race uh, to the bottom on the part of analysts trying to get their estimates you know, as low as where, where it can go. And I think there are some very definable reasons for it. The first one would be you know, trading has, has been very poor. The second would be investment banking hasn't been very good. Then we could go on to the fact that there will be increases in loan losses in uh, the energy and metals and mining sector. Uh, the one thing they I don't think have right is uh, interest rates. In other words, for five years, the federal funds rate has stayed at 15 basis points or below. It's now more than doubled. It's at 37 basis points. And everybody's complaining about the fact that it's not higher. Well, when the net interest margin doubles, it means that the bank's margins will go up. Uh, there are positives in the quarter. I mean, basically... Loan volume is much higher than you would normally expect to see it. Uh, You know, if we take the energy picture out, 
the loan loss issue is not bad. There'll be some pretty good control of expenses. So for those banks which are heavily capital markets oriented, big problems. For those banks which are more traditionally oriented, it's going to be a good quarter. I'm I'm interested in your thesis that the the misinformation actually harms the bank stocks because surely institutional investors aren't aren't making their decisions off of you know cable news networks. You're, you're exactly right, but I think that if if you think about it, I mean the president of the United States, the Congress, the media, the American public, you know, strongly believe that banks have been the cause of all of the disarray in the economy and financial markets for the last eight years. And therefore, it's very easy to make negative statements and, and, and have a big impact on stock prices. And I think 2015 is a perfect example. In 2015, the banking industry in the United States, if we take commercial banks, of which there are 5,500, had the highest revenues ever in their history had the highest pre-tax ever in their history, had the highest net ever in their history, and the stocks went down four times faster than the market. Well, the revenues were kind of um, fairly flat, weren't they, in the year before? I mean, it was slightly higher, but not much. I suppose the profits would, would, have, been, would have been improved in large part because of extensive cost-cutting, right? Well, I mean, basically, uh, earnings were up. Book values were up. You know, the, the, the stocks plunged to this incredibly low price because no one was looking at revenues or earnings or stock prices. They were looking at what the oil industry was gonna to do to destroy banking. And what's really fascinating here is that you know for the last seven years, the United States government has passed over 400 regulations, 300 of which have been put in place to increase the safety and soundness of the American banking industry. And in fact, it is safer and sounder. It's in the best condition, I would argue, in 50 years. And yet the market didn't believe it, didn't believe anything. That well, the I mean, sure, surely the, 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 the plus side um, uh, of all this is that this is a sort of buying opportunity. I mean, if you, if you think that much of the um, investment community is misinformed, then, um, you know, stocks are undervalued, right? Yeah, they're dramatically undervalued. I mean, why in heaven's name would... Bank of America sell at a 40% discount to book value? Why would Citigroup sell at a 40% discount to book value? If you look at book value, it's, it's cash. Both companies have more cash than they have book value, more than they have net, net worth. So these companies are selling at a 40% discount to cash. You know, it doesn't make any sense to me. Of course, these stocks are undervalued. All right, Dave, a very interesting thesis. Thanks so much, indeed, for joining us. Thank you. That's it for this week. All that's left to do is to thank Jaime, Julian and Dick, and then Laura, Patrick and Alistair, and thank you for listening. Remember, you can keep up to date with all of the latest banking stories at fd.com forward slash banking. 